Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and having me here. I'm going to talk about open source, fair source, and closed source. So I will explain what fair source is, and I'm going to tell you the story of how we got there. But first, my story. I started out in open source. I did all kinds of coding when I was younger. I would fix people's Apache servers. They'd PayPal me money. And I was essentially doing open source services and support, which is one of the open source business models. And then I was the first engineer at Bleacher Report, did a lot of closed source software for them, but we built on open source, like Ruby on Rails. And that was one of the things that made that company so successful. They were, you know, at one point, I think it might still be the number 40 site in the US, all built on an open source framework. It's fantastic. Next, I did a lot of open source when I was at Stanford CS. I worked on TLS implementations, so Firefox, Chrome, OpenSSL, even curl. And if you type curl dash dash help, you'll see one of the options that I added. I told my wife that one day, and I'm like, Ellen, open up your computer, go to the terminal, type that. And I did that, and she was not impressed at all. <laughs> but I will keep trying. I did a combination of open and closed source at Palantir and Blend, which is a consumer mortgage platform. And now, here at Sourcegraph, we do open, fair, and a little bit of closed source. And I will talk about what that all means. But first, this is Impact Tech. So the kind of impact that I want to have, and I know a lot of you share this with me, is one, I have gotten so much value out of contributing to this global code commons where people can look at my code and I can see code that helps me become a better programmer. I want more people to be able to participate in that, both using and contributing. And right now, frankly, most people don't have the luxury of contributing to open source because they can't give away their labor for free. Second thing is, I want to be able to point to something in the world, that speaker or that TV or that watch, and know that all of that code is public and hackable. And that's not the case right now. And I think of my future sons and daughters, when they're learning programming, when they're 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever, I want them to feel that the world is hackable. And it's not now. So this is what I'm going for. And you know, I don't have any uh, kids right now, but I do have a dog. This is Milton. He is on his way to becoming a programmer, but I think it's too late for the world to be hackable for his early years. He's on Instagram, by the way. <laughs> Milton Woof. So the rest of the time, I'm just going to talk about our story at Sourcegraph, how we solved our own internal question, how do we release our software? So what do we do? Sourcegraph is code intelligence for teams. It sits on top of code hosts like GitLab, big fans of GitLab, GitHub, or Bitbucket, and understands your company's code. And it lets you answer questions that come up all the time, like, how do I do this thing? Or who knows the most about this piece of code? Or if I change a piece of code, what's going to break? So developers love it. Companies were calling us. They said, we want this inside of our own network. We want this on our own code. Because initially, it was just something that you could use on open source code. And you know, we said, great. Like, we gave it to the first few companies that wanted it, some of the users. And then we had to figure out, how do we release this to all the people that want it? And you know, we were sitting in a, uh, it was a pretty hot night in Soma. This was last year. Our office would get really warm during the summer, and it wouldn't cool off for a long time. We were sitting there. I was probably on my like 12th Diet Coke for the day. And we had to figure out, how are we going to make this decision of, do we go open source? Do we go closed source? And we said, well, there are a few things that we believe. One, kind of like Priyanka said, the best product is what's important. People are not going to use it just because it's open source. It's not just because it's free. People want the best product. Yeah, you like that point? Yeah, he's uh, thumbs upping me. Second thing is, to build the best product, you need a sustainable business. You need to invest in R&D over the long term. Also, we think that people who are really good at building technology should build technology, not do services and support. It's not what they're good at. It's not fun. And that's not the way to build the best product. And finally, this is something that a lot of people here realize. Selling through developers is the best way in the history of mankind to get software inside of a company. It is so easy to get one developer in a company to love your product and then spread enterprise wide. That's what we believe. And how do we release our software in a way that's consistent with all of that? So you know, I was probably on my 14th Diet Coke at this point. And the big question was, open or closed? 
and we thought about it. You know, open source business models, that's a different question from open source. I love open source. I've done a lot of open source code. But when you think about how do you build a business on open source, it's just a different question. And we thought about it. All of the ways that companies build a business on open source, they're all about what do we withhold from our customers that they need. So you have open core, which is let's not give them the enterprise features they need. Let's make them pay for that. You have when they charge for services and support, it's let's make this a little bit harder and maybe don't document it as much. Don't make it as polished. They're going to need to call us. Pay us a boatload of money. You can charge for a hosted SaaS option, and usually that comes along with the software being hard to deploy in your own cloud. You can scare companies into thinking that they're going to be sued if they use your software in the wrong way, and that's dual licensing. Around here in SF, this might not be an option for that much longer, but you can just have the VCs pay for it. The problem is, for anyone who's sold enterprise software, they, they care so deeply about what is the long-term viability of this product. And so they need that, too. That's not a good answer to the question. Finally, you can just guilt them and request donations, but that doesn't really work out that well to build a really strong product, a big business. None of these seem that appealing to us. They're all complex. They're dancing around the issue of, we want to build a business on software. And they seemed kind of cruel to our customers and users who we want to use our software. We are on the same side. And we thought about it more. And open source businesses aren't even really open source. You have you know, open core, where by definition, a lot of the code is not open source. So is it really fair to call that an open source business? A lot of times, they have half of their code that's not open source. And you have misaligned incentives. It's so hard to figure out what do we keep as open source and what do we charge for. I think GitLab does a fantastic job of that. They're so generous. And, and I think that shows in the community they built. But most companies don't have that kind of vision to do that so well. Or if you're in services and support, then maybe a little bit more of your code is open source. But that last 25%, you're going to need to pay the company that built the software to do custom development for you. That code's not going to be open source. So even though we loved open source, we couldn't find a business model that expressed our love for open source and that aligned us with customers. Because in the end, it's really simple. We just want to charge businesses that benefit from using our product. Really simple. That's how software has always been sold. That means we focus on technology. And frankly, what we found out is our customers really want to pay because they like it. So you know, back in this hot room over in Soma, probably a few more Diet Cokes in, one of the people on our team just said, why can't we charge for the software and release the source code? And we all said, oh, no, 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 that's crazy. There's no open source license that lets you do that. No one is doing that. Like, that doesn't even make sense. We all said that. And he said it again. Why can't we charge for the software but still release the source code? And we said, well, like, no, you couldn't. Well, well. And we said, there might be something there. Maybe there's something that's not open, that's not closed. But this thing he said seemed to make a lot of sense for our business. No one's doing it. I wonder if there's a name for it. How do we do it? So we just felt there was a, a void in the middle. So we went to our favorite authority on source code licensing, Heather Meeker. She helped draft the Mozilla public license. She works with Google. She defended Android from Oracle, with apologies to those of you who have connections to Oracle. They're a great company, I'm sure. She used to be a software engineer, which is very rare for people who are lawyers. And we said, hey, we have this question. Why can't we charge for software but still release the source code? And so we created the Fair Source License. It's a really simple license. It's about 11 sentences. And basically, it makes it so all of our code is public and hackable and redistributable. Developers love that. Our team loves that. But it also means that if you're using our product in a company, and that company is getting business value out of it, they're going to pay us. It's that simple. That's the fair source license. And why is it fair? I mean, for customers, they can actually try the full product, not you know, whatever we choose to release is open source or whatever is free. They try the whole product, and they know what they're going to pay for. 
It's not the case that they're going to try the software, it's going to work OK, but then it's going to crash on a Saturday. They have to call us up in the middle of the night and pay us gobs of money. That's not our business model. Our business model is about making great software. And that's fair to customers. For us as a company, fair source is fair to us because we get paid for building great software. It's that simple. And I am the CEO. I feel a lot of responsibility for every single person on our team that, come in, that comes into work every day. They have families. Their families need them to put food on the table at the end of the day. They need for us to be a sustainable business. So it's fair to them. And for all the developers out there in the world, FairSource also has the promise of making it so they can contribute and participate in this amazing global code commons that I had the luxury of contributing to because I'm an engineer in SF. And you know, I have free time. I have a wife, but I don't have a family. And you know, I can afford to do that. Most people in the world can't, but FairSource has the promise of letting them release code and make a living off of it. So that's why we called it FAIR. We're not the only company that's using FAIR source. Also Code Envy, which makes an amazing product. It's really what, you know, imagine the future of an IDE, and that's what Code Envy is building. Uh, Tyler over there, he's the CEO of Code Envy, so he can tell you more about that and his experience with FAIR source if you are interested. Also, as of tonight, there is another company that has said they're going to release some of their software as fair source, and that's GitLab. So thank you, Sid. I thought it was a wonderful idea, and I, I said to you, we're going to release it at fair source zero, but I reconsidered during your talk. We're going to release it at fair source 10, and we're not going to charge anybody under 10 people. Beautiful. And I think this is a wonderful idea. That's awesome. I love it when I get to clap for someone in the audience. It's amazing. So there are a lot of other companies that are coming to us to say, what is the experience with FairSource like? And we're working with a lot more. So you will see more companies releasing their software as FairSource. It's a much better alternative than releasing it as closed or some other proprietary license. Because it means people have access to the source code, and you can build a sustainable business. So now the question for us back you know, in this Room and Soma, it was open source, fair source, or closed source. And if there's one thing that you all take away from this tonight, it's think a little bit more broadly. What is going to make it so your product is going to have the impact you want, so that you can build a sustainable business that's really innovative? What's going to do right by your team? Make it so they know that their families are going to be supported. And fair source might be an option. It's not an option for everyone. It's working great for us, and I think you're going to see a lot more companies using it. So next time you think of how do I get my company's software that people love out there in the world, consider fair source. That's all I ask. That's it. That's open source, fair source, and closed source. I would love to answer any questions you have, especially about using fair source yourself. <laughs>